Welcome everyone to another episode of Apocalypse's Historia, where we're going to come at you hard and fast today with a uh, quick real-time answering of uh, to some recent comments, lovely comments that we've had on our recent videos, and uh, you know, approaching the hundred subscriber mark here soon. So maybe, uh, maybe now that I've figured out the uh, audio, maybe I'll figure out how to do some of this streaming stuff. But uh, yeah, coming at you with a fast one today. We have our head skeptic here on the scene. Uh, the usual suspect is always Chance, and uh, here, why don't you lead us off with what we're getting into today. Well, howdy, howdy, folks. Uh, welcome back. Uh, just wanted to briefly respond to some comments. Uh, specifically, wanted to talk uh, about uh, what ThouTube is bringing up. Uh, ThouTube's one of uh, YouTube's resident Stratfordians, uh, holding up the old guard, and... Uh, He's uh, been pretty awesome about uh, uh, how much he's invested with commenting, how much thought he's put into all this, and definitely watching in good faith. So I super appreciate that, Thou Tube. Uh, let me see. Just want to sort of summarize what's happened with our, our little comment uh, repartee here. We got, uh, he brought up a, a good question. Like, why would we know who is working for, um, you know, the Chamberlain's men? in the Henslow era. Like, remember, this is the Henslow diary that we're talking about. Um, so I'm specifically talking about the 1598 to 16, what, oh, or 1597 to 1602, because that is when we're getting the contracts in the Henslow diary that specifically have the names. Um, my big point that I wanted to bring up in that video, and there's several other good points, but the big point that I wanted to bring up in that video is that we have every major writer from the period, every major playwright that we still hold up and we say, yeah, this play is worth republishing and reprinting. Every single major one is employed by Henslow in that five-year period, except for Shakespeare. I think that's a little weird. Um, at some point, why is Shakespeare so exclusive to the Chamberlain's men. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, every other person that we know that is a great writer is in Henslow and working for Henslow. And also, supposedly, many of those are working for the Chamberlain's men. So what is the exclusivity of Shakespeare about? That makes no sense. Um, so, um, Thoutube does bring up a good point, though. He says, why would we know who is or isn't working for the Lord Chamberlain's men because in my video I bring up that the ones that we do know are Johnson, Decker, and Shakespeare and we see both Johnson and Decker in Henslow but we don't see Shakespeare. Um, so we, we wouldn't know that and that's a great question and it would be wonderful if we could get that document because then we could cross compare and really actually start to study this because people aren't studying it. Um, people aren't making heads or tails of this other than folks like Carol Chillington um, and so, um, I had a few comments to that and I said, yeah, those are excellent points, but like the way that we don't talk about Henslow diary in relationship to Shakespeare is evasive. It's disingenuous. It doesn't make much sense. Um, and because of that, we sort of got this idea that the way that Shakespeare worked by, by himself in some bar or alley every now and then getting a couple lines from his, his lesser friends, um, that's not the norm. That doesn't make any sense. The norm is that this is happening with hardcore commercial pressure, um, that these things are getting pumped out, and that these things are getting reworked over and reworked over as they're getting played and played, and then getting reworked over when they get published. And uh, that's not always the narrative that we get from the mainstream Stratfordian guard. Um, that's just a fact. Um, and, you know, it... At some point, um, you know, uh, let me see, what Thou say? Thou said uh, that, you know, Shakespeare is in the diary. No, Shakespeare's not. The titles of plays that we attribute to William Shakespeare are in the diary. And then you said only once, but he's there. That's not right. That's not right, Thou too, but several times. It's uh, Henry the Sixth. It's Titus. It's uh, Henry the Fifth. It's Taming of a Shrew. Uh, or if we don't want to say Taming of a Shrew is by the same author as Taming of the Shrew then uh, William Shakespeare's a freaking thief then, I Caesar. guess. 
Um, yeah, Julius Caesar, which uh, I guess we're saying that's not the same, or Troilus and Cressetta, it's not the same, or Hamlet, it's not the same. I don't know when or where it is or isn't the same. That's for you guys to arbitrarily pick and decide. Uh, it doesn't make too much sense to me. But let's see. Um, that was kind of basically what I responded with. And then at some point, you know, when you couple this with Handy, which I know you, you, you want to minimize Handy's mysteriousness, but Handy is totally a giant mystery. It's a giant mystery for all Stratfordians, all Oxfordians. You have no real decent answer for when this is being written, um, who it's being written for, uh, where it's being played or if it's being played. All we have is surmise, and the surmise isn't really going to go anywhere because it's not based on <laughs> real evidence. Like, what we're guessing, uh, not Brady and I, but we as uh, humans, uh, we as readers, because we have to follow what, um, you know, some scholars are saying is that, yes, because this handwriting which, that doesn't match up, matches up with Shakespeare's signatures, which don't even match up with each other, um, we have to say this is Shakespeare, and so we have to say that it's being written in the early 90s uh, while he's still with Henslow, or it's being written in the um, late 90s, or early 1600s after he's with Henslow, and that they're getting a tossed away play. Neither of those make any sense, um, and that there's fantastic evidence against it. G go look at the evidence yourself. I've, I've presented to you a decent amount already. And you said, why do you specify an era? Well, it's because that's what I'm talking about in the video, buddy. I'm talking about the Henslow Diary. So I'm talking about the Henslow era. That's why I'm specifying an era. Same, is this Diana Price crap? I don't know. It, it could be. That's fine. The Diana Price isn't the worst thing out there. Um, let's see. What, what, do you, what do you say further? Um, he's mentioned by, multiple uh, by name multiple times during his career. Um, that, that's not what I'm arguing or not arguing here. Um, I'm arguing that his lack of existence in the Henslow Diary is conspicuous and needs answering. Uh, don't take me on some straw man, buddy. Uh, let me see. His name is on the books and legal documents connected to Kingsman. Kingsman's after this era, so that straw man, uh, get, get out of here with that. I'm talking about the Henslow Diary era. I'm talking about the height of theater. I'm, you know, th this, is, this is when Julius Caesar's coming out. This is when Hamlet's coming out, okay? Like, th this is when we have the War of the Theaters happening. I want an answer to what all of those events are in your current Stratfordian theory that's only a theory, it's not a fact. Your current Stratfordian theory has nothing to say about any of those things other than, sure, Shakespeare wrote everything we say he did in his absence in Henslow Diary is not conspicuous at all because he gets to be the lone exclusive writer in the whole era. Everybody else has to work for a living, but he's so dang gifted that he gets to just pick and choose what he wants. No, sorry, that doesn't make any sense. Um, combined with the fact that as I brought up the Parnassus plays, which I assume you haven't read, go read the Parnassus plays, please, because um, they don't mention really much about Shakespeare as a playwright at all. They mention him like he is just uh, some love poet. And that segues me to uh, my next point that I want to bring up. Um, there was a, um, a YouTuber that I told you to go watch, and I said uh, Ron Roffel. That is definitely a YouTuber that I want you to watch, but who I meant was Robert Boog. Uh, go check out Robert Boog. He's doing some like real actual document detective work following the money. And uh, he's got some interesting stuff to say about, like, the birthplace trust and um, what the connections are to Rosley. And I'm pretty sure he leans Oxfordian, but um, that's for you to go watch. Um, but I do want to actually bring up Ron Roffel, because Ron Roffel um, has a whole bit about Richard Barnfield. And Richard Barnfield points out that Shakespeare is really Edward de Vere, um, and uh, we can do some Alexander Waugh type code stuff. Uh, but as you'll notice, Dowtube, uh, top commenter here, and uh, there's some stuff that I agree with him here, but I want to sort of unpack everything that's happening here, because um, 
what we have here is we have Shakespeare in isolation. Just like that Henslow diary where we have Shakespeare in isolation, here we got Shakespeare in isolation. Um, Ron does, does some neat little code breaking to show you that the number 17 gets us to Devere from Shakespeare. Uh, but in this passage, to connect it to what I was saying about the Parnassus plays, where they only show Shakespeare as this love poet, let's read what this passage from Barnfield says about Shakespeare. And Shakespeare, thou whose honey-flowing vein, pleasing the world, thy praises doth obtain, whose Venus and whose Lucrece, sweet and chaste, thy name and fame's immortal book have placed. Live ever you, at least in fame live ever. Well, may the body die, but fame dies never. Okay, um, you know, that's all pretty, and we can do all the Alexander Wall code break, and we want to find Devere's 17 ways from Sunday. Um... But that's not why I bring it up. I want to point out that there's no talk at all about Shakespeare writing plays here. This is all praise for Venus and Adonis, whose fame will be immortal. Um, which I find is a pretty decent irony, because like that's the least read or interested... Or lauded. Yeah, lauded stuff in the whole Shakespeare canon. Everybody's interested in the plays or the sonnets. Like... By far, third place are the, the long poems. So um, that's already kind of funny. But um, what I want to point out further here is that, look, we can maybe find Devere all over this if we want, but there's four paragraphs here. And there's other people that we need to look into, into this question. At some point, if Devere is Shakespeare, that's fine. But why would Richard Barnfield, just some random guy, know that Devere is Shakespeare? And then just be writing about Spencer as Spencer, Daniel as Daniel, Drayton as Drayton. Like that, that's such a, a, a random instance in a vacuum. Um, who is Richard Barnfield? What is the relationship of Richard Barnfield to Devere or Shakespeare? Who is Richard Barnfield? What is the relationship of him to Drayton or him to Daniel or him to Spencer? Or any of these people to Shakespeare or any of these people to each other? None of those questions are being asked. And so we're getting all these super vacuous insipid answers like one person wrote the entire set of plays poems and sonnets sorry no, sorry. okay okay yeah sorry i was making sure i wasn't uh, getting no uh, no i'm just gonna yeah sum up your uh, your uh, definition um and and so it, at some point if we start looking at all these names and start asking that maybe they're all pseudonyms which shout out to bastion conrad he's at least asking are a lot or most of these names pseudonyms. I don't necessarily like his answer to the question, but Bastion's at least saying, guys, Samuel Daniel looks a lot like Shakespeare. Uh, there may be a lot of Drayton and Shakespeare, or there may be a lot of relationship between Daniel and Drayton. Um, and he does it with a lot of names, sure. Uh, but for these four specifically, like, here's the thing. I'm sitting here saying that they're not showing Shakespeare as a playwright, but we got... And Drayton, whose well-written tragedies and sweet epistles soar thy fame disguised, thy learned name is equal with the rest, whose stately numbers are so well addressed. Well, stately numbers, that should be code for, uh, you know, doing all this code cracking, but why was Drayton the signal to do it? That should also be a signal that Drayton's also a pen name. If you're going to do all this code cracking, go do that. Um, but furthermore, I want to show that, like, this has Shakespeare as the poet, and Drayton is the playwright. And I'm going to go right back over to my Henslow diary. And I'm going to show you that Thou Tube, well, he almost says the exact opposite. I think Drayton was mostly working on plays collabority and thought of himself as a poet rather than a playwright. Well, shoot, Barnfield disagrees with him or disagrees with your assertion of what Drayton thought of himself. Because we got over here saying Drayton's the tragedy and and Shakespeare's the poet, contrary to your beliefs, thou tube. So, I don't know, go back and read your Barnfield. Um, but let's go back to Barnfield. He's talking about Spencer, Daniel, and Drayton, Shakespeare. What do these four people all share in common? It's the Sydney circle. So probably start to understand that if you start looking with Sydney glasses, not just one little thing's going to pop out, a whole set of things is going to pop out. And here... For you guys that don't like that, you Oxfordians that don't like that, Oxford's part of the Sydney circle at some point. Remember, his daughter marries Philip Herbert. Although, if you go read any D biographies, 
as we've been doing recently and that will divulge later. Oftentimes it's called the Sydney John D circle or sometimes I've seen it just referred to as the Sydney circle so take that for what you will. And yeah, and that's a little, you know, kind of trailer snippet breadcrumb for the future. Brady's been doing a bunch of deep work, uh, maybe on the back of some suggestions of you commenters like uh, Six Days Theater, Anderson and Savannah, Alacrities, talking about follow the D. Um, D will get you where you want to go. And sure enough, that's what Oxfordian's been doing. That's been getting a lot of headway, but... Uh, Brady's been finding that there may be a lot more Sydney with D than there is any Oxford or Bacon even. Um, and so that is interesting, but save that for another video because that will be sort of a big microphone drop, uh, maybe a game changer for some of you folks, hopefully. Um, going back to this, though, not to detract from any of Ron Roffel's points in this video, because uh, I think that they're all, you know, very interesting. He does a lot of stuff with the number 17, which can point to Oxford, can also point to just Rosicrucian stuff. But I want to talk about just who the Sam heck is Richard Barnfield for a second, because that may make heads or tails of what's all being said. If Richard Barnfield's just Richard Barnfield, then okay, not no big deal, uh, other than how the heck does he, you know, know this secret code stuff and knows how to write you know, 17, like he's John D or something, or maybe John D is Richard Barnfield. Is that what we're suggesting? Well, no, let's look at Richard Barnfield for a second. His obscure, uh, excellent, though close relationship with Shakespeare has long made him interesting to scholars. It is suggested that he was the rival poet among many billions of others. Um, but let's see, bloody bloody yakety yakety, um, not a lot about him, but... In 89, he matriculated Oxford, took his degree in 92. He performed exercise for his master's, but seems to have left the university abruptly without getting his master's. It is conjectured he came to London in 93 and became acquainted with Watson and Drayton, perhaps with Edmund Spencer. Um, I think you're breeding. That's, I'll get there. That's all ascertained just from the poetry itself. So this is like recreating biography through the text, which is circular, which... Um, we've complained about before. Uh, let's continue. The death of Philip Sidney had occurred while Barnfield was still a schoolboy, but it seems to have strongly affected his imagination and to inspired some of his earliest verses. Why, why pray tell, would that have happened? Um, no, it's because Barnfield's a pen name. This may be a front man, but it's most certainly at least a pen name, if not a front man that's being paid to use his name for a pen name. I don't know if this is a clue because baptized can always be sort of documented backwards and you know, it's just yeah. like, oh, look, here, look, here's a, here's an entry here that, you know, case closed, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so let's look, what's, what's he get famous? Barnfield published anonymously, so don't even know that it's Barnfield. Uh, the affectionate shepherd dedicated with familiar devotion to Penelope Lady Rich. Why the heck would some broke... London kid named Richard Barnfield, no Penelope Lady Rich. This guy's, what, 20 at the time? Maybe 19? It says in his 21st year, but that doesn't even add... Okay, so that means he's 20 going on 21, I suppose. So, yeah, he's 20 years old. This is ridiculous. Um, sort of a florid ra romance uh, in the manner of Lodge and Shakespeare, dealing with the complaint of Daphnis for the love of Ganymede. Um, and then... It's like, what, what, what even is that? What's happening? Well, guys, if you go read that, it's pretty obvious that this is about Philip Sidney, Edward Dyer, and Penelope Rich. Edward Dyer is madly in love with Philip Sidney, which just go read England's Helicon if you haven't done that. That'll tell you enough as it is, and I'll show you in a second here. Um, but Dyer is madly in love with Sidney, but Sidney's madly in love with Penelope Rich. And, you know... Okay, that's fine. Maybe he's telling a story back about the 80s, but this is coming out in the mid, early mid-90s. So at some point, uh, why all the Sydney stuff still? Maybe, maybe it's just become this cool obsession for folks, but that seems awfully confessional for Dyer just to be doing it for commercial purposes, especially if he's using a pen name. So um, no, that wouldn't make any sense. Like, I think we have, you know... Uh, I think Sydney's still alive, and I think Barnfield's still pining over Sydney, and Sydney's still pining over Penelope, and that 
make sense when you look at it that way. But as soon as you know that, as soon as you know that Dyer is Barnfield, um, all of this starts to make sense. And then what's the last line say? Well made the body die, and we have die, die. But fame dies never. So we have all these die puns, like dyer, like to dye clothes with, you know, t tints and chemicals and colors. That's a sort of a chemical thing I kind of re realized too the other day. There's a bu there's a bunch of stuff about mixing colors and sort of creating new ones. And so that's I realized that that was kind of interesting with the dyer last name. And you'll see that all over Shakespeare when you do that. Maybe a clue that you're reading a dyer passage. Because, uh, yeah, let's just go look at who Edward Dyer is. Um, he's a courtier and poet. Um, first patron was the Earl of Leicester. That's Sidney's uncle. That's Robert Dudley. Um, seems to have put him forward as a rival to Christopher Hatton as the Queen's favorite. Um, they, this, at least this website, you Oxfordians are rolling around in your grave. Uh, don't like my mind to me a kingdom is being given to Dyer. Um, I, I see arguments for both sides. And, you know, at some point, Dyer and Devere are very close. And so it could be that they're, you know, sort of co-writing it or, you know, there, there may be something like that. I'm not saying that is the, the case. But remember, Dyer and Devere are just, they're not separate. Uh, Dyer is not just an influence on Sydney, he's an influence on Devere. But let's see. Philip Sidney and he were companions in everything. He was Corridan's cousin Dyer. And so, now that you know he's Corridon's or Corridon. And when we go into England's Helicon, we can find a lot of Phyllis, a lot of Corridon. Almost every song or poem is about Phyllis and Corridon. Not, not every single one, but a big chunk of them. And often they're by Edward Dyer or Philip Sidney, which makes sense because Corridon is Edward Dyer. Phyllis is Philip Sidney. But some of them aren't. Some of them are by, as you see here, George Peel. We got a Corridon thing. Uh, this one, Nicholas Breton, uh, is doing Phyllis in Corridon. Um, you'll see Robert Greene. You'll see um, others in here. A lot of our sort of usual suspect names that are the great writers, uh, po poets, or playwrights of the uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s. I want to specifically show this Nicholas Breton one because it calls a lot into question. And maybe just this document has the wrong name, but it sure has Nicholas Breton in here a lot. And he sure seems to be doing a lot of Phyllis and Corridon, even if this one's specifically supposed to be Edward Dyer and not Nicholas Breton. Uh, there still is a lot of other Nicholas Breton that sure says there's some connection there. But I want to go ahead and show you that Nicholas Breton's a pen name. So it says, on a hill there grows a flower, fair befall the dainty sweet. By that flower there is a bower where the heavenly muses meet. In that bower there is a chair, fringed all about with gold, where doth fit the fairest fair that ever I did yet behold. It is Phyllis, fair and bright, she that is the shepherd's joy, she that Venus did despite and did blind her little boy. This is she, the wife the rich, which the rich, maybe Penelope Rich, shout out, that the world desires to see. This is the Ipsaqua, the which there is none, but only she. Who would not this face admire? Who would not this saint adore? And, you know, remember Philip Sidney's almost like a saint figure for dying for the Protestant cause. Who would not this sight desire, though we thought to see no more? O oh, fair eyes, yet let me see. One good look and I am gone. Look on me, for I am he, thy silly, thy poor silly Corridon. So, yeah, maybe Breton's just doing a bit and getting in the mind of Corridon, but that's a weird thing to do if Corridon's an actual person. Um, and so I think this is Dyer saying, look, I am Nicholas Breton. Look on me, for I am he, thy poor silly Corridon. Thou that art the shepherd's queen, look upon thy silly swain. By thy comfort have been seen. Dead men brought to life again. So there's a little shout out to Philip Sidney being still alive. We have Edward Dyer as Nicholas Breton. He is our Corridon, as we saw, Cousin Dyer. This is our guy. Um, and once you know this, you can start to make heads or tails of a lot of stuff. Um, and you can at least start to ask the right questions. Because there are questions out there that I have that I don't really quite understand. Like, what is Thomas Watson and Abraham France's relationship to this whole scene? And 
why is Thomas Watson referred to as Amentas by scholars, like almost unquestionably, but then Ferdinando Stanley is also referred to as Amentas by scholars almost unquestionably. And so you, what you have is you have Spencerian scholars saying, ah, Ferdinando Stanley's Amentas, surely. But then you have scholars in the rest of the Renaissance field, like Shakespeare or um, any of these university wit scholars studying up on Thomas Watson. They're like, ah, he's Amentas. And so it's like, okay, which is, which is it? Um, that's already weird. But uh, sure seems like Thomas Watson's also doing a lot of this Phyllis stuff. And Abraham France and Thomas Watson are supposed to be associated with this, you know, Sydney Circle. And, oh, that's weird. Watson published his 1590 poem on the Elegy of the Death of Walsingham, who, remember, is Philip Sidney's father-in-law. And if Philip Sidney is faking his death, it is through the help and at the behest of Francis Walsingham. Um, but there's also weird stuff with Watson. Watson was with Marlowe when Marlowe maybe killed a guy. Um, so I don't know a lot of weird stuff with Watson that I don't know exactly where to go, but I can maybe begin to understand it. If I apply these Sydney and Dyer lenses. Um, and so, yeah, we also have the, uh, Arden of Faversham, they say is largely Watson's work and that's based on stylistic evidence. But if you do enough stylistic evidence with the assumption that these people aren't all different people people and that they're people that they say that they're not and that there's co-writers within singular writers um if you start to try to put that into your stylometric uh, analysis or your just stylistic analysis things maybe might start to make sense i do want to give the oxfordians a shout out uh the little we have of watson's prose is highly euphuistic when i see euphuistic i do think oxford because i think of lily who's the main writer of de vere and i've wondered if Maybe if we want to go find De Vere's early playwright work, maybe go to Lily. Maybe a lot of Lily is De Vere. Maybe all of Lily is De Vere. And so if we can spot Lily and Shakespeare, that'd be a way to spot De Vere and Shakespeare. So you Oxfordians, uh, more Lily analysis, please. Um, all right. I will get off of the Ammon Toss rabbit hole. I didn't have an answer for that. I just want to point out that there's a lot of wacky, weird stuff going on, and we're doing it because we have Spencer in isolation. We have Shakespeare in isolation, and people aren't closing the gap. Um, so, Thoutube, thank you for leading me down this rabbit hole. Uh, thank you for commenting not just on my video, but over here on Ron Roffel's video, because that would not have let me get this whole sort of full circle thing that shows, look, you got to look at Edward Dyer, to make heads or tail this um you got to look at not just shakespeare but drayton daniel spencer you got to question almost every writer in this era because they have shoddy biographies they are just gentlemen at best that are probably if they are real people getting paid to use their names on publications so that these Aristocrats, for whatever reason, for various reasons, probably because it's going through state propaganda like Walsingham, the names can't be put on it. They have to build up these persona of regular blue-collar folks so that the blue-collar people can swallow it up. Um, and I would like to, at this point, you know, redefine post-Stratfordian because, you know, Obviously, if you're Stratfordian, you believe one dude wrote all the sonnets and all the playwrights attributed to William Shakespeare. And if you label yourself an anti-Stratfordian, you end up being like, well, it was all Bacon. Well, it was all De Vere. Well, it was all such and such. Whoever, take your pick. Marlowe. Right? But I feel like that's not post-Stratfordian. You're still wholly attributing all of the works to one person, which we're kind of trying to Yeah, you're to like show. trans Stratfordian. You're just... <laughs> yeah. And I, I, don't, I don't mean it in that sense. I mean, like, yeah, you're just going across. You're not going forward. You're not going past it. You're just switching out a different person. Yeah, post-Stratfordian Stratford, curious or something, you know. Like, oh, man, we're still on that same. Yeah, like... Uh, but, like, seriously, uh, I, I think trans Stratfordian is a good way to put it because it's not going beyond that question of um how can one person put all of this genius together um why does one person get so much emphasis in the publication and the reteaching and the sort of canonization um 
why is this one person, you know, so poorly documented? Um, all those questions, like just putting one person in for that, it's not really going to answer it. And you're just maybe switching it to a more likely fantasy. You know, um, it's not really giving us a factual basis. It's not giving us a psychological basis. Um, you need multiple, multiple, multiple names to answer just Shakespeare alone. But I think in order to even do that, you need to start answering other names. Like, who is Thomas Decker? Who in the world is Thomas Decker? And that is sort of what I'm getting at when I'm asking ThouTube over here. Um, the War of the Theaters. Parnassus Plays. Those aren't about Shakespeare. Those are Thomas Decker things. But yet we constantly see a bunch of scholarship about Shakespeare. And we do see some bizarre Shakespeare connections. Like um, the Parnassus place says that Shakespeare purged Johnson and gave him the pill. Um, Shakespeare never purged Johnson. That was Decker that purged Johnson. And uh, the Satira Mastics um, literally gave a character named Crispinus a pill and it shut him up. And so, like, that is a nod to say that whoever's writing the Parnassus plays at least thinks that Thomas Decker is the writer behind Shakespeare. And that if we didn't have the folio and we didn't get this exact codified canonization of what we do and don't think is Shakespeare, uh, and we didn't get some printing with Decker's name on Satira Mastics, we'd probably say, Satira Mastics, oh, that's Shakespeare, and, uh, you know, he got Johnson good. Um doesn't make any sense if if we just ignore the Parnassus plays and then once we do that and see that maybe Shakespeare's not an exact unique entity outside of Johnson, Decker, and Marston and that maybe Shakespeare is composed of at least Decker and maybe Johnson also and that Shakespeare is maybe a bunch of others watching those three uh, the, the War of the Theaters might make sense and Shakespeare's weird auxiliary role in it might start to make sense if you start to ask just alone who is Thomas Decker um, some of these questions might be made sense of and as we stand Oxfordians can't answer that Baconians can't answer that Stratfordians can't answer that and I'm darn interested in what just the heck is happening in that war of the theaters because that's happening kind of at the the height and climax of this whole theatrical scene right at the end of Elizabeth, uh, right as we go into the, you know, Jacobian era, um, right as we're getting, you know, fantastic plays, Julius Caesar, Hamlet, I've named them already. Um, so, yeah, let me get off of this, get off of our Henslow conversation. Once again, thanks to ThouTube. Um, Bastion, if you're watching this at all, I hope that some of this answers how I feel about... Um, England's Helicon and what's happening with Bodenham. And uh, I think it's hard to say that Dyer's not all over that book. Uh, both Dyer and Sidney's presence, whether they're poetry or poetry about them, it's all over that book. And, you know, if you're going to say Marlowe wrote the whole dang book, what the heck is Marlowe's relationship to these men? Why is he writing whole freaking books about them? Why is he using 17 different pen names to do it? Oh, there we go, 17 again. Um, okay. And, yeah, here's a copy of uh, Barnfield's The Affectionate Shepherd, but um, it's all about, yeah, this older guy loving sweet face boy, that's Sydney, older guy, that's uh, Barnfield, and uh, the guy, the young boy is too in love with the fair queen, Gwendolyn, that's Penelope Rich, um, that's why this is dedicated to Penelope Rich, and that's why he said, um, albeit the gift, uh, sorry, and be, albeit the gift be all too mean, too mean an offering for thine ivory shrine, yet must thy beauty my just blame sustain, since it is mortal, but thyself divine. So he's saying, you're the reason I had to write this. Sorry if this, you know, isn't very good, or sorry if it hurts your feelings, maybe, uh, but it's because of you that this whole thing happened, so I have to write it. Um, makes no sense if it's Barnfield. Makes all the sense in the world if it's d uh, Dyer. Um, okay. So, yeah, y'all start looking for Dyer because he's wrapped up in all this. And um, maybe I should uh, get 
this tab back open because I do want to give Brady another shout out. Oh, dyer and alchemist. So Brady said dye, color mixing. That's a lot like, you know, alchemy. Yeah. Uh, Go back to his Wikipedia page too because actually at the bottom paragraph of Dyer's Wikipedia. Okay. Um, even right here, even though you know people are suggesting that he to be a Rosicrucian, he was a firm believer in alchemy. It's doubtfully an organized Rosicrucian movement during his time. Like, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, if you do think that there is an organized Rosicrucian movement, Dyer's totally in it. So, you Baconians that think there totally is, you got to look into it. Um, and, uh, yeah, go back to this page. Uh, on the basis of Dyer's reports of the success of Kelly and D. Scryer that influenced Elizabeth and Burley to take Kelly's claim seriously, Dyer worked with Kelly in his laboratory. Uh, in Bohemia for about six months. So Dyer's super wrapped up in all this John D stuff. So you guys that are doing all this John D research with all the code switching and all this stuff, Edward Dyer's like super tied in with him. Come on, super duper 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 tied in with him. And that's why talking about all this is like a nod to Devere and all that and doing all this John D type cryptography and then not saying that Richard Barnfield is Edward Dyer seems like you don't fully understand what's going on. Come on, guys. All right, thanks. That's it. Um, next question. All right. Uh, we're moving onwards, moving upwards. That's it for that little spiel. Um, let's see. Um, thanks for watching this one, guys. We're going to come at you all uh, very soon with another video, and we're going to talk about some similar stuff. Uh, this whole time I kept asking, who's Thomas Decker? Who's Thomas Decker? It doesn't have to be Decker. You can ask that about Chettle. You can ask that about, um, you can ask that about just about any of these guys. You can ask that about Richard Barnfield. You can ask that about Thomas Watson. You can ask that about John Webster. Just start naming the list. Who are these writers? Maybe some of them are these people, but you need to prove that. Because at this point, if one biography is suspect, let's assume that they're all suspect because they're starting to look like that. Um, okay, we will come at you very soon with a video looking at maybe who is Thomas Decker, at least maybe start to look at how we can figure that out. Um, hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, keep coming in with the comments. Keep coming in with the dissension. It's very much helping us with our research. Um, keep coming in with the support. That's also super helping us with our research. Um, Specifically, yeah, uh, want to give a shout out to all you guys commenting because it's helped Brady go dig some historical research and it's helped me go look at some of the texts themselves and make some close readings. Um, if you folks are out there and like have a exact candidate that you super believe is the the writer, please in the comments let us know like. You know, somebody in a few videos ago said, guys, you need to start looking into Walter Raleigh. And um, I have, I haven't done enough, and I will come at you with more Raleigh hopefully soon. Um, but even, yeah, looking at a text of Raleigh got me to some more Dyer, Devere, Sydney stuff that we'll drop in on maybe two or three videos from now. Um, but yeah, like, please, let me know. If you think it's Neville, if you think it's North, if you think it's Mary Sydney, if you think it's Devere, if you think it's Marlowe, if you think it's, um, uh, you know, Bacon, uh, it, it, let, let us know if you, if our Philip Sidney stuff's helping convince you at all. Maybe you are uh, got another uh, sort of uh, wild card. Uh, John Florio's still hovering in the distance, and we need to get back to him. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks for listening, guys. Let us know who, who you think, uh, what you think, and uh, keep digging further. Keep looking into Sidney. Keep looking into Dyer. Um, keep reading your Shakespeare. Keep reading your other folks. Uh, all right. Stay tuned, guys. Yeah, just like all these Royal Society folk uh, coined, Nullius and Verba.